invite you to open your Bibles. He has a pew Bibles too. If you need a pew Bible, to Hebrews chapter 12. I want to start out with this. On August the 3rd, 2016, uh, Emirates Airlines Flight 521 crashed at the Dubai International Airport. And and that's quite an airport, and it's a fascinating place to go in and out of, uh, but not when your plane crashes. The pilots, uh, according to the report, they they set the plane down, and then uh, got the warning immediately, you you landed too late, and there's not going to be enough runway to get this thing safely stopped. So you need, to take, you need to take off again and uh, come back around. So they initiated the go-around procedure and allowed them to, to lift off and hopefully circle the airport. Well, what happened was they, they lifted and then they lost, they lost their lift. And that plane came dropping back down suddenly to the, the runway. And they skidded for about 800 yards and uh, finally came to a stop. And according, you know, thanks to a you know, great well-trained flight crew... The 300 passengers all were able to exit the plane, get to safety before the plane was completely consumed by flames. So it was, it was tight. Now, you know, glad the story ended with a happy ending. Well, if you'd been watching this unravel, you might have felt a little differently about the whole story because of the way the evacuation unfolded. There's a troubling phenomenon. So what you would have seen is all of these frightened passengers exiting the plane, uh, jumping on the evacuation slide and heading out like this, holding their carry on, holding on to their carry on luggage. Every, things wrapped around their wrapped around their necks, all their carry on luggage with them, and then uh, just these passengers uh, while the plane is consumed by flames. Just walking around uh, the tarmac with their luggage, their carry-on stuff. Uh, they got a picture. Okay, this is, uh, this is actually from a video of that flight. And so just grab, I wanted to grab this one picture. The video is fascinating. But what you see is the plane has crashed. Emergency evacuation procedures in play. There is smoke entering the cabin already, but they're all fighting for their overhead luggage. This person's taking video because they can't get out of their seat to get themselves off the plane. Uh, You see the uh, potential difficulties with this, right? You know, there's a reason they have that safety thing at the beginning of a flight. However, probably everybody on that flight has seen it. If you're flying in out of Dubai, you may have seen it a lot. Uh, You have heard it. You've seen the demonstration. You've heard the warnings. But a lot of people just disregard what needs to be done. Now, Flight 521 is not the only time this phenomenon has been observed. Photographs of the evacuation of Cathay Pacific plane show passengers sliding down the chutes. Again, bags in hand, uh, things over their arms, over their shoulders. Asiana Flight 214 crashed in San Francisco. A number of passengers were photographed walking away from the burning wreckage, clutching their carry-on stuff. Uh, on that flight, a police officer who made, you know, qu- they quick, f- security folks making their way to the plane to help the passengers get to safety, had to physically restrain passengers from climbing back onto a plane that was already beginning to uh, be captured by flame. Uh, British Airways 2276 in Las Vegas, U.S. Airways 1702 continue to prove the pattern. We have another picture here for you. That's a good one. Uh, you see the plane's down. Uh, they lost their wheels in the front. And they're jumping down and everybody trying to come off with bags and all those things that, uh, that, that make, a, make an evacuation complicated. It does not need to be said that grabbing your suitcase during an evacua- evacuation is a bad idea. Especially a uh, can be a deadly idea. Because what happens, according to uh, that little safety talk, is that if you're, if you're fighting for your bag, overhead bag, and you're uh, trying to get off with that bag, you're, you're not only endangering yourself getting off the plane safely, but you're keeping other people from getting off safely. And uh, there's a reason why they do those safety things. Because it's not just your life that gets affected. It's other people's lives too. 
Uh, also, uh, on those slides, a bag like that can be a pretty dangerous thing hurtling down, uh, <laughs> down that slide. The National Transportation Safety Board found, uh, and this was true, uh, all cultures, airlines, uh, anywhere in the world, that right at half of passengers attempt to retrieve their bags during an emergency situation and an evacuation. And uh, had one, uh, had, yeah, I love that picture. She thinks she's at Disneyland. Woo! Uh, while she has gathered up all that stuff, there's a mass of people back there who cannot get off a plane. So as I see those photographs, and I came across this article, it's fascinating to me. I started looking at more of it, and you know, you start looking at links and oh man, uh, there's a whole lot of crazy going on in the world. And sometimes we get caught up in the crazy. Sometimes we are the crazy. It reminded me of a passage of scripture from the book of Hebrews, a couple of chapters over from where I read earlier in chapter 10. This is in chapter 12 of Hebrews. And uh, like the passage that we read a while ago, it starts with a therefore. And so we have to ask, what is the therefore therefore? Well, the therefore is therefore, pointing back to chapter 11. Chapter 11 of Hebrews is a great faith chapter. In the Bible, it's a powerful testimony of faith. By faith is a little phrase that occurs over and over and over again in chapter 11. By faith. By faith. Here's what Abraham did. By faith. Here's what Moses did. By faith. Here's what these heroes of the faith have accomplished. Because they trusted God, followed God, believed that what God said was true, and amazing things happened. And so then you get to chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore based on that incredible testimony. Therefore, since we have such a large cloud of witnesses, he's talking about all those heroes of the faith from chapter 11, surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Um, a lot of things that we're packing that we don't need to be packing with us, and especially in time of crisis, lay aside those things and let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, the author of Hebrews compares the Christian life to a race. And he, he warns us, if you're going to run the race well, you just don't need to be hauling around a bunch of extra stuff. You see someone, I'm going to run a marathon, but I'm going to do it in a crazy costume. You know, it may not be the best way to run a marathon a lot of times, right? Uh, you, you, don't, you don't put on your fireman gear to run a marathon. The, the Christian life, this life with Christ, it's a marathon. It's a long run. And if we're going to make it to the end, if we're going to endure, we need to get rid of every possible hindrance, everything that's going to drag us down, keep us down, slow us down. Uh, Kent Hughes commenting on this passage says, A hindrance is something otherwise good that weighs you down spiritually. It could be a friendship. Nothing wrong with friendship, right? But if it's a friendship that leads you away from God instead of toward God, it's a hindrance to your walk with God. An association, an event, a place, a habit, a pleasure, an entertainment, an honor. But if this otherwise good thing drags you down, you need to set it aside, put it away, get it out, out, of the, out of the debris trail of your life. Now, a suitcase, perfectly different thing. It, it, it just might kill you, though, in an emergency evacuation from a plane. Perfectly good thing, but it's not enough to risk your life for. And what is more, you don't want to risk somebody else's life. And there are eternal consequences to all this stuff. And we think about the things that hinder us, slow us down, keep us from running this race with Christ well. See, it's not only that it's going to keep you from right relationship to God, from healthy relationship to God, productive harvest relationship to God, but you may be holding back your family. You may be holding back your friends. You're holding back those people in your circles of influence where eternity is going to come to bear on people's eternal souls but we weren't willing to give up the things that hinder us, the sin and sometimes the good things that aren't the best things in God's plan that keep us from God. Now, at the root of our many sins, and I came across this somewhere in my reading, and 
I love this concept. At the root of many of our sins is the assumption that we are exceptional. And uh, exceptional, not in, he's an exceptionally gifted at athletics. She is exceptionally gifted at mathematics. Uh, I'm talking about, I am exceptional, which means I'm the exception to every rule. Rules are good, and rules apply, just, just not to me. They apply to somebody, but not to me. From the beginning of mankind's history, we see this through the scriptures. We have not liked rules, and we deceive ourselves by saying, yeah, that, that rule, I mean, it's a good rule, just not for me. I don't think all of you should follow that rule, but I think I'm the exception to the rule. I think that I, 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 get, a, I get a pass on this one. It does not apply to my story. Uh, example, 1 Samuel 13. So in 1 Samuel 13, you have King Saul, and he's about to go to battle, and he wants to invoke the Lord's help, and then wants to do this sacrifice, but he starts thinking, I know, I know the rule. I know that the prophet priest Samuel's the guy who has to do this, but he's not here, slacker. Where is he? He's supposed to already be here. He's running late. The battle is not going to wait on us. I need to do something. So I know what the rule is, what the law of God is, what God's statement about this has been from the law of Moses. However, special circumstances demand that I just step over what God says because of my situation. See, my situation just negates what God says. And it led to the destruction of uh, his rule and his family and his life. It is human nature to feel like we're special. That somehow we deserve things to go our way. No matter what the obstacles, there's this self-will thing, this selfishness thing that drives a, a lot of what inspires sin in us. And, and it blinds us to things. There, there are things that, that get said and done like, uh, I see it all the time in all kinds of different places. People say, I, I want, let, me get, let me give you some advice. Here's my advice to you. Just follow your heart. Have you ever said something stupid to someone before? Like that? I started to raise a question. Have you ever said that before? And you know you've sinned because you did, I, but I didn't do it because it's a new year. I'm feeling gracious in the new year. Not next Sunday, but today I did. I felt gracious. Yeah, just follow your heart. Well, that's terrible advice to give to somebody. You know why? Because God's Word talks about the heart. Here's what God's Word says. The Holy Spirit inspires Jeremiah to write down, the heart is deceitful of all, above all things and desperately wicked. Your heart's going to lie to you. Your heart's going to guide you down the wrong... Don't tell somebody to follow their heart. That's terrible advice. Because your heart's sinful. You follow the Lord. You look to the Savior. You, where's your source of truth? And so that's... Uh, that's the idea. However, God knows the human heart. And making decisions without the aid of God, uh, the, the Holy Spirit is going to tempt us to some rule-breaking, justifying, rationalizing, convincing ourselves our situation is the exception to the rule. Here's some examples. I'm running late. Now, I don't want people to think I'm irresponsible. That I didn't plan ahead. Don't want my boss think badly of me. I recognize there needs, there, there needs to be traffic laws in the world. But I'm such an awesome driver. And my circumstances dictate between, between my house and work, it's going to be the Autobahn today. And I'm, I'm just going to drive like a maniac because I'm going to get there on time. Because I have rationalized that what is good for me is good, even if it's dangerous to other people. And ultimately, it's probably still dangerous to me too. But I rationalized my behavior. Speed limits are good for everybody else. We know the golden rule. Do unto others, you'd have them do unto you. That's a good rule. We, we know the Bible talks about be slow to anger, answer softly. But you don't know what they did. You don't know how disappointed I was when my order didn't come on time. I'm going off on somebody. 
Because all those things about how we use our words and what our Christian testimony looks like in public places when we, we, but I have my rights. And so my rights trump what God's word says about relationships and about caring for people and all that. And so, boy, it's game on. It's Yosemite Sam time. Just start going so fast, you raise yourself off the ground, shooting guns. How many of you know what that means? How many of you know Yosemite Sam? Thank you. It's not a cartoon that comes on much anymore. And so once again, I've, all of you raise your hands because you're old, because it's not on anymore. Uh, he has anger issues, so we don't show commercials that we're, kids, we're a, a guy has anger issues like Yosemite Sam, right? Uh, I know the Bible says. Oh, we, we read it just a moment ago in uh, Hebrews 10. You shouldn't neglect the meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing. You shouldn't skip getting together with God's people. Because, and the reason God said to do it every week is because at least you're never going to be more than seven days away from God and God's people and hearing from God's Word. So that's what you ought to do it on a regular basis. It ought to be a part of your routine. But a lot of people say, well, yeah, but not for me. I mean, I can, I can stretch that out a little bit. I can get by without doing that on a regular basis. I, I, can, I can manage because I'm awesome. I'm me. You just don't know what I'm capable of. And, and uh, my family can stay close to God, whether God's regularly in front of my family or not. And man, it just doesn't work that way. I'm the exception to that rule that God has given about being an active part of a group of believers, wherever you are. Uh, here's another one. You've given witness to this too. So I was, uh, Ron and I, been out to eat some more, a little more than we usually do during uh, the Christmas season, holiday season, and uh, we're in two different restaurants where we had, uh, where I was, at a clear view of the bar area, and so, and, and because I'm an old guy, I eat at five o'clock, you know, in bed by seven thirty, kind of thing. So it's pretty. So this is I'm getting the after work crowd, and so this is a crowd of people around both of these bars, and they're going at it, not just a little bit of drinking, they're drinking hard, and. Uh, I keep watching, and they're having fun, and they're enjoying each other. And then they all got up at the same time, both places, this group of people, drinking hard, drinking long, because they were there the whole time we were there, and drink, 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 drink. And they got up, and I know they went out and got into cars and drove away. Because see that whole thing about drink, right? They're the exception to that rule. Well, you know, I mean, I can, and they're stumbling. I, 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 can, handle, I can handle it. I'll be fine. Don't, don't worry about me. I can, I can hold my liquor. And I said, well, uh, Rhonda, let's, uh, we don't ever order dessert, but let's order dessert because we don't want to be on the road till they're done doing whatever crazy they're going to do to the rest of the world. I'm the exception. Uh, There's a long list of that. We could fill books, probably should fill books about it, but we need to expose the exceptional assumptions for what they really are and our exceptional assumption of this selfish pride that the world revolves around me that I am my greatest source of truth and that depending on the day I can be an exception to every rule and whatever I am carrying around whatever baggage whatever crazy whatever sin I can I can do it without risk of destruction without consequence I can get away with it because I'm me and it's a pride. It's a pride. So that's when we get, well, I, I don't need to read my Bible. And I can still have a close relationship with God. I, I can just fire off a sentence prayer here and there. I don't need to have a time of really devoted, focused prayer time with God because I, I can manage just fine without it. I don't need to be a part of Christian community. I don't need to I don't need to actively share my faith with other people. I don't need to care about God's work around the world. See, I don't need any of those things that the Bible over and over again says these are big deals. I can discard all that stuff because I'm me. And who knows better than me what a relationship to God look like? Certainly not God. What could he know? That's, that's the rationalization of it all. And it gets really, really dark and, and ugly. John Bloom uh, was writing about this, uh, this concept, and I enjoy his, his writing. He said, behind every willful sin, every conscious act of disobedience to God is a presumption that what God says is best for the masses, but it need not apply to us. So we're born with the belief that we're the best ref- referees of righteousness and justice for ourselves. We're the most 
We're the most uh, reliable definers and appliers, he writes, of love, honor, and respect. And we love to feed ourselves this line. But that's just how sin and temptation works. What, what is sin and temptation? It looks like that. It, it's, it's not always, well, I think I'm going to go out and rob a bank today. wonder what banks are open on Sunday. That's not how sin works. It's more subtle than that. And it's a whole lot of justifying, rationalizing, marginalizing what God says, elevating what I think, feel, or just what my preference might be on a given day to the highest level of authority. And how do we know, how do we know this happens in the world? Because you know everybody else who's doing it. Now, we, can be, we have a blind spot about ourselves. That's absolutely going to be true. You, 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 you tell yourself the same story enough times, you, you start believing it. But we can, say, we can look at everyone else and say, you know, you know what your problem is? You know where you're coming up short? Uh, you know how you're justifying it? You, you're, you turn your back. Because your stuff's different than my stuff. I can see yours, and you can see mine. We know that we're doing this and it's a big part of I am not laying aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles I'm, I'm running with it but see I can handle it I'm the guy that can manage it and we do a lot of sin management it's ironic that we feel so indignant about uh, other people's sinfulness and we indulge our own but see our sin doesn't seem so bad and our pride just skews our self-perception. When we evaluate our motives and actions, we tend to view ourselves as these road-colored glasses and a lot of delusional kind of pride. Now, this kind of pride is going to weigh you down in this race that is the Christian life, the Hebrews 12.1. A lot more than we realize, because all of this is just a gateway to a sinful character, and it opens a door to any number of sins, rationalization. You just, it's like you just open a floodgate when you start down this path and a whole lot of things become okay that God said just not okay. A whole lot of things become dangerous that God said beware, run the other way, flee this temptation. Meanwhile, it's, you know, well, yeah, but see, it's me. So it's one more drink, one more piece of pie. Yeah, see, I got personal now. One more lust-filled click. And the weight just gets a little heavier and a little heavier. And, you know, your spiritual affections get a little duller. And your capacity to love gets a little smaller. And your tolerance for anything that interferes with your selfish desires, it just grows thinner and thinner. And before you know it, you're in a spiritual health crisis. And you find you're very far from God, very far from the cross of Christ. And, and you, you, how did I get to here? One little step at a time. I'm reading a book uh, called Atomic Habits, and it's a, a New York Times bestseller kind of book. Uh, it's a fascinating book because it's all these incremental things you do in a day that add up to something really significant. It's all the small things. It's not, well, today I'm going to become an Olympic athlete. It's Olympic athlete did a whole lot of getting up every day and doing certain things. And it was those small things of what they eat and how they train and just showing up every day that results in someone who runs the race well. Now, if you want a diagnostic check on this, this is helpful to me. Uh, and this is some of my reading, I came, came away with this. Just common symptoms of this exceptional pride. I'm the exception to every rule. A lack of gratitude. Why should I be grateful? I deserve everything I have. I'm awesome. And when you have a lack of gratitude for everything, to the big stuff, to the details of life, lack of gratitude will reveal a lot. Bitterness. Why? I, it should always work out for me. Everything should always be up and to the right in my life. I should never experience adversity or pain or loss or trouble or hurt. Uh, that, that envy reveals this kind of... Uh, kind of a life. I, I ought to be honored. I ought to be respected. They ought to be pointing to me as the example in this. Impatience. I should never have to wait on other people. 
and have to be patient with other people's faults and failures because I'm awesome. Why, why should I have to do well, I should never have to wait in line. I should never have to be stuck in traffic. You start having those feelings. Those are revealing that kind of character that is, that is boiling somewhere down inside of you. Irritability. I shouldn't have to put up with this inconvenience. Covetousness. I should have what they have. Indulgence. I should, whatever I want, I ought to have. Uh, whatever I crave, it should be coming my way. And e even after coming to Christ, this is a wrestling match for believers. It's an ongoing struggle for us. This sin nature that resides in us. And we start, you can go along and you can have good seasons. You can have good runs. And then you realize, I don't even know where this came from, but I'm carrying it everywhere I go. I, I don't know where I picked it up, but here it is. And it's, it's as if it just jumps into your hand because that's how temptation and that's how sin, uh, that's how those hindrances arrive. Not often because I made an intentional plan to step away from God. It, it creeps up on you. And a lot of this, we're just looking for keys to freedom and joy and fulfillment. And we think, well, maybe, maybe this is my, maybe this is it. Maybe, I feel, you know, there's a lot broken about me and maybe this is what makes me feel better about me. Maybe this is what restores the empty spots in me. Maybe this is what dulls the pain in me. And, and you look everywhere except to the Lord. And it ends up draining the real joy that only comes from, from things like giving to others, serving others, honoring others, and, and loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength because that's what fills your cup. That's what, that's what energizes, that's what renews, that's what gives hope and joy and peace and love and all those things that are truly only a gift from God. And so we have to begin to lay aside this sinful pride. And the way you do that is to, is to say, first confess, God, this is not you. And I confess to you my sin, I confess to you that I'm trusting in a lot of other stuff for all, a lot of things that only you can provide. I confess it, but more than that, I'm going to repent of it, which means I'm also going to put it down. A lot of people say, oh yeah, here's my sin, and uh, off I go, carrying it still, clutching it close. You have to repent of that, which means you put it down and you walk away from it. And then, beyond, uh, beyond that, to ask, ask the Holy Spirit, okay, reveal to me my hidden faults. It's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Reveal to me, it's a great prayer, reveal to me my hidden faults. The stuff I am blind to, the stuff I do not see. The stuff that I've, I've convinced myself is okay, that I don't, I don't, I've dulled my sensitive spirit in this area. Reveal that stuff to me. Now here's what happens. You pray that prayer, God, I know the things in me that are keeping me from really all in with you. So I confess those. I repent of those. I ask you to reveal the things I don't see. The more that you uh, kind of wince at that prayer, the more you need to pray that prayer. Because there's where the barrier's coming in. But here's the great part. When you give this to the Lord, uh, He's glad to take it off your hands. In uh, my plan for a new year. Uh, over the last several years, I've had different things that kind of, okay, this is what I want to focus on, I want to meditate on, on a regular basis uh, for my relationship to the Lord, my walk with Christ. And a few, a few years ago, my word, and I, and I print it in big letters, and I put it where I can see it, and often that's close to my computer, where it's just going to be in front of me every day, I'm going to see it multiple times a day, my word was abide. Uh, John 15, abide. What does it mean to walk in a relationship to God? It means to abide with Him. That I am going to be with Him and He is with me. I'm going to uh, do all I can to stay on Him. This year, I have big letters, big font, right under my computer. Fix my eyes on Jesus. And I just want to think about that. I want to meditate on what that means for me any given day. Fix my eyes on Jesus. Let, let my attentions be on Him. With all the distractions there are in this world, just, just keep me there. Because it's going to keep me in all the right place. And, and Oh, there's so many things. I know, I know my heart. 
And I know I'm always scanning, always skimming, always looking for so many other things. What can make me feel better? What can get, bring me encouragement? What can bring me relief? What can bring me joy? What can bring, make me really happy? And you are, you're, you're wired the same way. And all those things become substitutes. Squeeze out the Jesus in us. And distance us from the Lord. So when we fix our eyes. That so desire. The, the old hymn prone to wonder Lord I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. This is one of those times. Oh I just feel it. I feel it all the time. So how do you fix your eyes on Jesus? Uh, we'll give you some quick things. First. When I fix my eyes, I lay aside every encumbrance. I'm going to put some things away I do not need. Fix my eyes is used in Hebrews 12. It means more than just looking towards something. It means I'm going to have to give up looking at other stuff. I'm going to have to take my gaze away from other things that I think will make me happy, give me fulfillment, fill my cup to divide our attention, ungodly, unproductive, worldly things. Uh, messes with my spiritual growth. And it's going to leave me hurting, wanting, tired. Instead of running this race well for the Lord, you end up with this wandering heart. And you're just chasing, uh, chasing rabbits. Here's the, here's the narrow way that leads to life. And few are those who find it, Jesus said. And yet, we're, we're, we're just running, chasing Maybe, maybe this, maybe this. There's this hobby. There's this uh, opportunity. There, I'm going to pour myself into my work to the detriment of everything else in my life. I'm going to pour myself into this relationship that I know is destructive, but I'm going to go for it anyway. And we suck the spiritual life right out of our own souls. And all that just to, to, to mask our hurt, our pain, our fear. To, so we don't feel feel so broken, feel so dark, feel, feel pain. We medicate our pain in all kinds of different ways with all the wrong things. The good news is I do not have to do the heavy lifting on this because if I'll fix my eyes on Jesus, he does the hard work. He's the one who makes this happen. And my worries and my fears that lead me to become entangled in these temporary solutions, short-term happiness, you know what they do? I just start running. I, I'm moving slower and slower. When it comes to the cross, I'm not heading that way. I, I, I'm looking everywhere except Jesus. Fix my eyes on Jesus. And I'll start laying aside the things that hinder and the sin which so easily entangles. When I fix my eyes, I run with endurance. And that's how he describes it. I, I haven't been a runner in a lot of years for all kinds of different reasons. But uh, when I was running on a regular basis, there are a few things I really enjoyed less. And I know some of you, you're really dedicated to this. You say, I'm, I'm, you know, I have a goal. My goal is a you know, half marathon. And that's, you know, my goal is I'm, I'm going to train for a marathon. So that's my motivation out there. For me, with running, it was like, I'm going to get to the stop sign. I'm going to get to that tree. My short-term goals. I mean, atomic habits, it's all about short-term for me. If I'm going to get to where I want to be. And... We've got quite a race ahead of us. We don't know what 2019 holds for us. But it is set out with mile markers of joy and suffering, of peace, maybe grief. But those markers are out there. You know, I can, I can tell you the day all those markers were hit for me in 2018. Felt them in a deep, uh, powerful way. A lot of you did too. And if we're going to do this well... We have to run with endurance. Uh, and it's hard. The race is hard. That's, that's one of those things that a lot of people run from. The race is hard. So if the race is already going to be hard, I don't want to be hauling this with me on the race. You see, you see where this goes? That even, even in the sweet downhill side of the race, there, there's still a weariness that will set in on you. And uh, our hearts and minds anchor to the fleeting fixations of our eyes. Where we fix our eyes determines how the race is going to go. So fix our eyes. Fix our eyes. Now, when I fix my eyes, 
I realize God is working for my good and his glory. You know, there's a passage in, uh, and I'm doing this out of order, so sorry about that on the slides, but I consider, this is Romans 8, I consider the sufferings of the present time are not worth comparing with the, gl- with the glory that will be revealed to us. No matter how difficult it is here, it's going to be awesome there, so much that it far overshadows. And that's a good transition between two and three. I run with endurance, and God is working for my good and his glory. Stop and consider for just a moment that Jesus Christ, the author, the perfecter of your faith, that he began your faith, he sustains your faith, he will complete your faith. And when I meditate on that, you know, what the circumstances feel like today, where the hurt is, where the pain is, where the difficulties are, where the challenges are around me, in me, on me, this is just easier to lay down because I realize it's not going to be there. It's going to be with him and it's going to be in running the race with him, not just one of these days, but right now with him. And I submit to his will for my life and I trust him and I find in him everything that I need for forgiveness, eternal life, And he's going to take care of the race. So I fix my eyes on him. And just the assurance that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. He started this in me. and He's not going to abandon me now. He's not nearly done with me. He's not nearly done with you. Uh, I love that that phrase. He is the lover of my soul, the creator of the universe, and he is working for my good. And when I fix my eyes, I can just see Jesus clearly. Hebrews 12, 2 ends, it recounts the gospel that Christ is the sinless Savior who humbled himself to the will of the Father that bore the sins of the world that we could be free. And with that in mind, it's amazing to me, after all Christ has done for me, and I want you to really consider this, after all he has done, that, that I still go back and I find myself trying to pick stuff up. That, that, I'm, that I'm moving along and I find myself hauling stuff with me. I think, I don't want to just run this race well. I want to finish it well. I don't just want to finish it well. I want to run every leg of the race well. You considered that? A, like, hey, yeah, I was all in. Man, our youth group when I was in high school, they were great. I just loved Jesus, and I was serving Jesus, and then in my 20s, I kind of bailed on that because, you know, I had other things to do, you know, off at college, kind of wheels off, and then, oh, then my 30s, I started having kids, so, well, we got to get back in church because we need some spiritual influence on our kids' lives. My 30s and 40s, boy, I was there, and I was in. My 50s, my 60s, my 70s, ah, I can take it or leave it. I don't have to worry about my kids anymore. They're going to do what they're going to do, and I'm on my own, and so I can disengage from all of that stuff, but not from everything because I'm going to start picking up this. And I'm going to pick up this. And I'm going to have all these other things that are trying to capture my focus, my, my eyes, my attention. And my relationship to Christ gets robbed and sidelined and rationalized and lost in the shuffle. When I fix my eyes, I see Jesus so clearly that Christ, a sinless Savior, did everything for me and I must Fix my eyes on Jesus. It's a great hymn. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim. Things that seem so shiny and beautiful. The things of earth will grow strangely dim. In the light of his glory and grace.